forward. We are now recording. Welcome everyone to Chainsaw Maintenance and Safety at the Country Living Expo um, in the digital realm. My name is Catherine. I'm with the Snohomish Conservation District and I'll talk you through some of the, uh, how this is gonna flow today. Um, our instructor is Steve Van Valkenburg and I will introduce him in a moment. There he is, waving. Um, I've got one more person to admit here. If you have questions, Steve will stop at various points during his presentation and you may either raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. There's a reactions button. If you click on that, there is a choice to raise your hand. So you may do that and I will keep track of that. The other option there, there's uh, Steve just a, um, uh, displayed that, uh, demonstrated that, and I can do the same thing here. Actually, I uh, don't know that I can. Um, thank you, Steve. The other option is for you to type a question in the chat, and I will keep track of those, and we will answer those at the, at the breaks and at the end. So there will be plenty of uh, time for questions. We are recording this class. Um, so if you have your um, video going, you may appear in the recording unless you put it on speaker view only. You can always mute your video if you would rather not be, if you would rather not be recorded. What is a conservation district? So we are here with the Snohomish Conservation District, and we are a free type, uh, we provide free technical assistance and financial assistance to land managers in Snohomish County and on Camino Island. We're a subunit of state government, but we are non regulatory. We provide this assistance to help people improve water quality, habitat, soil health, and productivity resiliency during climate change. We're working on many different things in many different areas. So if you ever have a question about managing your land and stewardship, please let us know and reach out. We're happy to help. One of the ways that we also provide uh, assistance to people is through events. And you can always check our website for upcoming events. One of our uh, uh, workshops coming up on February 3rd is an online discussion about trees and their role in mitigating climate change practices with trees in agriculture specifically that can help um, sequester carbon. This will be the first in the series, uh, an online discussion series. So we hope that you can join us for that. And our native plant sale uh, coming up at the end of the month, but pre-orders close on February 10th. So if you haven't placed your order yet, please do so soon. We wish to thank our partners today. We're hugely grateful to Washington State University Extension, the Livestock Master Foundation, WSU Skagit, and Snohomish County Extension Livestock Advisor Program, and the Cattlemen's Association for putting on the Country Living Expo in a virtual manner this year. We're happy that we didn't have to give this up. And then we're also thankful to Arlington Hardware. Uh, Steve Van Valkenburg, our presenter today, worked at Arlington Hardware providing education for a number of years, but he's also been an educator for much of his life. He taught agriculture for 30 years, and he's also been helping guide the Snohomish Conservation District on the Board of Supervisors. He's been um, guiding our uh, vision and our work for 10 years at least. He has also logged and reforested land, so he knows his way around the equipment he'll be discussing today. With that, I'll turn this over to Steve. Please help me welcome him. And if you, again, if you have questions, raise your hand or put them in the chat. Okay, we're gonna go to, I'll get my uh, screen up here and get started. Um, let's see, oops. Go back in here. This one, there's, there's clicking, share. Why are we not getting it? You have to tell us. Tell us. There you go. Okay, you should see me on the screen, my smiling face, my workplace. Looks, looks good, Steve. So, um, welcome to Chainsaw Maintenance. And I work in, currently at Arlington Hardware, um, which is, this is our saw shop there. Uh, we're a small part, we started that part of the, 
of a 103 year old biz family owned business about seven or eight years ago. And I started working out in that part of the, the saw shop, managed it for a few years. And now I'm down to just one day a week. They're kind of trying to retire, sneak out the back door. Um, well, I still can. And, uh, uh, but this is kind of what I do. I, I live and breathe equipment. Uh, yesterday I did a, 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 a dog and pony show on tractor maintenance and today it's me and chainsaws so uh, while i don't know anyone now so you can do the math um, i enjoy talking about them and sometimes i've already warned catherine that I, i'll chase a rabbit at a heartbeat so if i get carried away and off track she's going to drag me back into the, the train um, I usually present this in about a two hour presentation. So I'm gonna to have to move fairly quickly, but I really want to encourage you folks to ask questions. Uh, anything you don't understand that I say, please ask. And we'll do that two ways. You, uh, as Catherine said, you can do the little click under reactions for raise your hand. Uh, best way probably is to jot a quick note more to yourself than anything in the chat box. And then I'll stop at various places through here and we'll, um, I'll uh, say, okay, what questions are there? And Catherine will, will relay those questions to me. So with that, let's get started. So we're gonna talk about preventive maintenance. And, and these, this is my stable of chainsaws. And you can see there's all sizes from one down here with a three foot bar up to these little guys with uh, 12 inch bars and, and, and everything in between. So I run a variety of saws and I run a, 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 for a variety of things. Um, as, as Catherine said, I taught agricultural mechanics for, for 30 years. So we worked on these kinds of things. I work on these currently, but I also use them professionally in the woods, uh, both logging on the weekends, clearing land. And then also uh, after I retired from teaching, I worked professionally in the woods for several years. Uh, doing logging, uh, running saws, running heavy equipment, and so on. So I, I'm pretty familiar with, with uh, the problems you're going to encounter in taking care of your saws. So what is preventive chainsaw maintenance? Well, preventive maintenance is what you do each time you use your saw to prevent it from breaking down and to keep it running smoothly and have it ready for the next time you need to, to operate it. Things like, for example, we're gonna talk about mixing uh, the fuel properly and proper lubrication for the saw, cleaning of debris from the saw body uh, so it operates properly and cools properly and so on. Uh, adjusting the, the bar and chain is important because that really is the heart of your of your, your saw. Without a good bar and chain, you're not gonna cut well. And then of course, we're gonna cover some stuff on sharpening for maximum performance. Um, that's a technique you have to learn. I can show you some basic things about it, but you're really gonna have to learn um, by, by continuous practice what the best way is. One of the best things you can do is get yourself an operator's manual. If you didn't get one, if you bought your saw new and you didn't get one, uh, and I, if, if it's a steel saw, we can probably provide you some at our saw shop. Um, if you did get one and you stuck it away in a drawer, please read it because it's going to cover in depth what I'm going to cover in the next 90 minutes. And you can go back to it and, and look things up again and again as you forget them. And the things it's going to cover in there, for example, safety, where the controls and operating instructions are, how to fuel and lubricate it, how to sharpen the chain. There's actually some of the same diagrams. I'm gonna show you how to adjust the chain, tune up instructions, and then some safe cutting techniques. And why do we worry about safety with a chainsaw? Because while a chainsaw is one of the best tools you can have around the farmstead, it's also probably the most dangerous. Um, happens. In fact, this is a, a little chart from 2018. Out of 25,202 chainsaw accidents in this in that time, these dots represent the number of points that the chainsaw touched the human body. And when it's moving chainsaw touches the body, it is not pretty. It is always messy, painful, and involves a trip to the to the emergency room. So we practice safety all the time to make sure that we don't have that kind of problem. There's also information about your chainsaw. There's all you know, weight and displacement and all that kind of stuff. What kind of bar and chain goes on it, what chain, what spark plug goes on it and so on. Uh, so good useful information when you're doing your tune up and maintenance. Also, of course, the general nomenclature and parts. When they we talk about the bar adjuster, where is the bar adjuster studs? Where are the uh, 
fuel field, the oil field caps, where is the starter handle, the weather um, for summer or winter switch, uh, the master control lever, trigger, and so on. So those kinds of things um, are all explained in depth in your, in your uh, owner's manual, along with some stuff about sharpening the chain. And we're gonna look more about that later in this little session about maintenance. For example, this happens to be removing uh, the uh, air cleaner on a, a farm and ranch series or a professional series chainsaw. And of course, replacement parts. These are the drive sprockets and things that make the chain go at basically the clutch on your, on your engine. Uh, also, there'll be a general maintenance schedule. What do I do when? Uh, do I, what do I do every day or before starting work? What do I do every week, month, year, et cetera? Uh, so you, you are planning a maintenance kind of thing to go through your unit. So it's always going to operate the way you want it. And then, of course, we're going to talk about how to start the chainsaw safely. There's really three good techniques. I've shown two of them here. I'll talk about all three of them here before we get done. And then uh, there's a little bit also in your owner's manual about uh, how to use the chainsaw for proper falling of timber and, of course, then things to, how to keep from pinching your saw in a log. Uh, in other words, we call it bucking operations, uh, cutting a log in half. Uh, where do you work first and where do you work second? All that stuff is in here. And I'm not really covering any of that because that's be kind of beyond the scope of the class today, but that is in your owner's manual. So, uh, and then of course, always is your, is your chainsaw dealer, wherever you're at, um, whatever brand you have, it, it really doesn't matter. We answer questions while we're a steel uh, chainsaw dealer. Um, we answer questions about all saws, particularly the operations. And when you get to talk about chain, we can make up chain for any make a saw. And our people in there, uh, this is Calvin, he's our young fellow we just hired. Uh, he's a, a certified steel tech. I am, Neil is, all the guys that work in there um, are certified steel technicians. So we can answer your questions about these, about chainsaws. Um, so I'm just gonna make a quick stop here. Catherine, do we have any questions that people might have raised yet? Not that I see, nothing yet. All right, very good. So let's march on into maintenance. One of the first thing you want to do is clean your saw, clean saw daily. Every time I come in from the wood, I clean my saw off because of a number of things. That shows me if there's any maintenance problems I can see quickly. Uh, I don't like to work around dirt. The saw doesn't like to have dirt, especially getting in the cooling fins of the engine. So we're going to clean all that stuff off. Uh, if you don't have compressed air in your garage or your shop, a brush, even an old toothbrush will work. Just get that dirt off of it, get the sawdust and thing that's accumulated on it. And then we're going to loosen the bar nuts, okay? Either there's two nuts or one nut on the side with your wrench, you're gonna loosen those. Or if it's a toolless type bar nut, just turn it, loosen that. And then we're gonna untension the chain and some saws have the tensioner in the side. Others, it's in the front here. Okay, uh, either the front of the engine housing or the front of the side cover. It should be just on the other side. You'll back that off three or four turns. This tension, the other direction, turn that black wheel and it untensions the chain. And uh, models have the chain break in the side cover. Um, let me find a picture of a chain break real quick here. And then all, you, so you see what I'm talking about. Um, okay, this one. This handle right here is the chain break. Uh, this is the chain break on this one. Um, th this is the chain break on this one, this one up here. It has to be in the released or back position toward the handle. Um, if it's forward, what it does, it's intended, and we'll talk about this again in a minute, but it's intended to stop that chain immediately from full throttle to immediate stop in case of a kickback. But in the case of many types of saws, that um, chain break is located in the side cover here. That's not true on stills, but it is true on some makes. If when you loosen that bar net right here, or these bar nuts here, and that side cover comes off, doesn't want to come off, check and see if that chain break is released because if you haven't released it and you pry it off of there we've got a locked on chain break and you got to take it to the saw shop to have it released it's really tough to do uh, it leads to a lot of bad words for our saw techs i can tell you that firsthand so so just make sure that your chain break is unlocked especially if that's in the side cover uh, before you try to remove um, 
the side cover from the, the saw. Once you've got the side cover off, the, here's your bar studs, um, all your bar and chain will come off. Now you're gonna clean all that off underneath. And what you've got exposed here is the underside of the side cover that the chain runs around. And this is the clutch and the drive sprocket. And there's a couple types of drive sprockets and we'll look at those. Clean out the inside of the side cover. You can scrape it out and show what I'm doing here. Uh, you can use a good wire brush or a heavy bristle brush, or you can use air, clean it all out, get all that stuff out of there. Cause this is sawdust. Sometimes I've found parts of limbs even crammed in here, like small cedar limbs. Um, and that's gonna uh, collect oil and things from the oiler, which is at this point, and it's going to just kind of continue to build up in here and clog things up. Also that oil in the sawdust here will continue to weep out even after the saw is done. And if you set it down in your garage floor, it's gonna make a mess right there. I never set my saws down except on a piece of cardboard or rag or a board because they are just going to, always gonna leak, weep and leak a little bit of, of oil out of this out of this residue that's in here. So if you get rid of that, that just makes it a lot better. And of course, if you're gonna do any work in here, it just makes it a lot easier to work on. And you can look for problems at the si same time. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna inspect my clutch sprocket. Okay, this is the clutch sprocket. This particular type is called a, uh, a uh, rim sprocket. There's also spur sprockets, which this one is. And these are two that came into our shop in the last month. You can see that this one is worn so that there's actually a groove. That groove is not supposed to be there. So what happened was the operator would run in, uh, put the saw down onto the wood, uh, rev it up full throttle, and the chain wouldn't go anywhere because basically it was just spinning around and around the sprocket through these notches. Same thing happened on this particular one. This is a spur sprocket, or excuse me, a rim sprocket, and it actually cut the rim sprocket right in half and even gouged into the, the clutch and into the bearing. Uh, so uh, it should have never gone that far. That was simply never looking at this and, and recognizing that you're seeing a wear pattern. And those can be replaced very easily. Rim sprockets, by the way, are about eight, uh, eight bucks a piece. Spur sprockets, because they include the whole clutch, come to more like about 25 to 30, depending on your on your size of saw and the brand of saw. And they can so they can be replaced really easy. It's a common maintenance item that's going to wear in your saw over time. Okay, and these are the two types of sprockets I talked about. This is a, again a um, spur sprocket. Inside is a bearing. When I take these off, there's a little E-clip that holds it on. Let me back up one. You can see that E-clip. It's right here and then a big washer and that holds the, the rim sprocket on or the same thing is true of the spur sprocket. And you can take a little screwdriver and go in there. Put your hand over the top of that when you pry that, that E-clip off because it will fly if you don't. Um, you only really need to take that off if you suspect that you need to replace or relube this bearing, which I do about once a year on mine is all, okay? Uh, also note this little notch right here on both. See that little notch right there by my cursor? It's on both of these two sprockets. That is the, the drive for the oiler. So when you pull that off, look and see where that's at, because there's a little rod that comes out from the oiler, which is housed underneath of the um, actual clutch and that little rod has to re-engage that when you put it back on. If it's not, it doesn't line up and doesn't hit that, it just pushes it down out of the way and you don't end up oiling your saw properly. So check that when it comes off, okay? All right, this is your oiler hole, your chain oiler hole, make sure that is clear. These two little plastic things right here are called bumpers uh, and you can blow them out if you're using compressed air. So watch, you don't do that because they just kind of pull out and push back in. But you can check and make sure your oiler hole is clear. It doesn't squirt out of there, it kind of oozes out. And if you really want to check your oiler to see if it's oiling correctly, just start your engine up at this point, run at full throttle, your clutch will work and it will drive the oil pump and you will see it oozing out of here. Okay, a big drool of oil coming down and that's all the oil you need in these saws. It doesn't squirt out or anything else, okay? But you can check that. And I usually check mine about every six months or so to see, make sure it's performing correctly and, and it is clear. Okay, uh, next I'm gonna clean the bar and the, the groove in the bar because uh, this groove will collect all kinds of sawdust and, and oil and stuff in there. So I all the way down and out both sides. 
and then I will check the bar oil hole. There's only, it's only in one side here. And the other side, uh, it's underneath, it's on the far side because that, when it goes on the chainsaw, it goes against that oil hole so that the oil coming out of that oiler is forced into this hole up into this groove and the chain then picks it up and we'll look at that in a couple of minutes. The chain picks it up and distributes it across the bar. I also go down to the far end of the bar and I make sure the sprocket nose rolls freely. Okay. If it doesn't roll freely, I'll put a little uh, like WD or some other solvent in it and get it spinning around. And then I'll put some good oil in it, some bar oil or even engine oil and roll it around because there is ball bearings inside of here. Um, there, and I'll show again this part of it later, there are some of the older and bigger saws that had a grease point. There's a hole back in here that you can actually inject grease into that. And I'll, I'll show you that. Um, some of the older saws also, and some of the new saws that are real small bars that the artisans use for wood carving, this end does not have a sprocket. It's actually hard hardened. It's hard faced on the end. And so just make sure that is clean too. Okay, so check the sprocket nose, check the bar oil, make sure that it, the oil hole, make sure those are clean. And then uh, if there's any burrs on the side of the, of the uh, bar, I'm gonna back up a couple of slides maybe i can see that just a little bit easier uh okay let's look at this slide again so what i'm going to look at is i'm going to take my thumbnail and i'm going to scrape it along the side here up toward the top and as that chain runs along the bar <coughs> excuse me it tends to burr over the side of the bar and so what i'll want to do is clean those off and you can do it with a um tool like this. This is the one we use as a deburring tool. It's got a file in it. We call it a joiner. It's got a file in it that runs along the side or a short piece of file. So we just run it along there. It's kind of got a hand guard on it too. You can use a file. You can even use a, a sander if you want and just clean off that burr off the edges of the uh, uh, bar. And I, all I do is check for it. And if, if it's got a burr, I clean it off. And, and I would say probably once every six months if I'm cutting hard, I have to deburr the bar. Okay. And uh, next we're gonna remove the uh, filter cover, okay? And some have just a lever, some of them have a, you have to use a screwdriver, we're gonna remove that. Often to remove the filter cover, it's easiest if you put the, uh, if you can see where my cursor's at down here on the lower right picture, the um, master control switch all the way in down in the full choke position. It, it clears all the projections and things on the air cleaner cover. Then I'm going to blow off the air cleaner. When I'm doing that, I'm going to blow off everything, get all the dirt out of here because not only is this air going into the engine, but it's also going around the engine for cooling. So I want all the sawdust and stuff out of there. Next, oh, and don't let your get this is one that came into us uh, a week ago in the saw shop. Don't let it get this dirty. Guy complained about it not starting easily, and I can see why. That thing, I don't know how any air got into the inside of that engine at all. Uh, that is not one day's, that is weeks or months accumulation of sawdust onto the air cleaner. Okay, then you can remove your air cleaner. <clears throat> um, and some of them just take a, like a little screwdriver and a little ear down here and you flip it up. Some of them, there's a nut or screws that you undo. This is that one I showed you that was very dirty. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to blow off the carburetor. Before I do that, I'm gonna make sure I don't blow any dirt down inside the carburetor. I'm either, if the choke is part of the carburetor, I can just close the choke off this air and let up this case of mini uh, saws is in part of the air filter itself i'll put my thumb over that hole or i'll put a, a rubber stopper in that hole so not blowing any dirt down inside the carburetor and then i'll blow all this area off really good get it really clean it so um, not only does it attract uh, more dirt and heat but it also interferes with the linkage like your your throttle linkage here and your choke linkage which is on the other side and just makes operation a little more difficult so get that area clean too while you're at it <clears throat> all right so now if you want to check your spark plug and, and uh, you know, people ask me how often do I change my spark plug? Well, I change it when it needs to be changed, which means it could be this saw is eight years old of mine. And uh, I think it's on its maybe third plug and I use it quite a bit. So, um, but there's a trick to kind of changing that. And that's this rubber boot is on there pretty tight, particularly with engine heat. And you don't have a lot of room. You can see the little bit of, of, uh, high tension lead or wire you have here. So kind of a technique is I 
I get my screwdriver kind of behind the boot here and with one hand and I get my other hand over the boot and I'll wiggle or worm that boot up and down so it breaks it free. And then as I pull backwards, I can pull it out and yet I'm not gonna yank it um, I'm away from the saw because now, and these will separate, either you yank the wire out of the boot or you yank the, the wire off the, the magneto down inside here in the starting cover, both of which are usually gonna entail a trip to your hardware, to your saw dealer and um, tell your sad story about how you, you tore your saw apart accidentally. So uh, be careful when you pull these off, okay? And that, that exposes your spark plug. And now you can put your spark plug or saw wrench, we call them a scrunch, just got a screwdriver and wrench. This is the bar nut idea and that's the spark plug in. Uh, you put that on there, loosen your spark plug and take it out, examine your spark plug. If it looks got a good brown uh, tint to it, it's been burning clean, put it back in and run it. If it, the end of the electrode is worn, or if it's fouled with oil, put a new spark plug in, okay? All right, and some indications of spark plug needs <clears throat> replacement, hard starting, okay? That's one of the indications. There's other things that can cause it to be hard starting. Uh, slow acceleration of the saw, poor operating performance. In other words, not want to reach top speed and not want to, you know, cut, uh, not want to reach uh, full power as you think it would. When you pull the plug out, if you've seen a worn or badly uh, corroded or, or oiled up, fouled, we call a dirty plug uh, on the, the electrode on the end. Always replace it with a properly gapped uh, 20 to 30 thousandths. So I, I gap them at 30. Uh, uh, some of the books recommend 20 uh, of the proper type. And, and the proper type is four two cycle operations because the, your lawnmowers and rototillers are probably four cycle engines. These are two cycles in which the oil is mixed in with the gas and it takes a little different spark plug heat range and design to burn successfully in that engine. So you can look in your operator's manual or ask your saw shop for the correct plug. Okay, so I'm gonna stop at this point because the next thing we're gonna talk about is fuel and, and ask Catherine if there's any questions that I need to answer at this point. No, no, no questions yet. Was well, everybody still awake, or have I, or have I said everything I <laughs> need to say? I don't know. Have I maybe I <laughs> BS? I don't know. All right, so let's go. On, let's go on to fuels and the and the filters. Okay, so um, so while you're doing this, the next thing I do is flip my saw on its side, and I would open the fuel cap, and I will check the fuel filter. Now this is an official steel tools piece of stainless rod with a hook on the end. I can reach in and snag the my fuel line and fuel filter, but you can make this out of a piece of, you know, 16th inch welding rod or a piece of coat hanger or something, something that just six or eight inches long of wire with a little, just a little tiny hook in the end, you just reach inside the, the fuel tank, snag your, your fuel filter, kind of floats around and bangs around inside of the fuel tank at the end of a, of a rubber hose. So just grab that, pull it up out. This is as far as you're gonna get it out. So um, if I'm gonna replace this, I have the, the new filter right handy laying right here, because I'm gonna grab this end with one hand and the filter with the other hand, and I'm gonna pop that one off and I'm gonna grab the other filter and stick it right back on and pop it back in the tank, okay? And again, I only replace my, my filter as long with, along with my spark plug when I do an actual tune up about every two years or so. Uh, if you have other problems, and I'll show you some other problems you can encounter that I replace all, excuse me, all the time. I'll, also at this time, I wanna check my fuel lines for cracks or sponginess, and particularly if you're running ethanol, uh, ethanol gasoline, um, and it's been sitting in it for a long time. This fuel line can get real spongy. And if it's been, the tank has been setting empty for a number of years, as we get a lot of customers that have inherited their dads or their grandma, uh, grandfather's or their grandmother's chainsaw. Uh, and the tank has been empty, but it previously had ethanol fuel for run through it. It'll make this line not only spongy, but in some cases it'll be real brittle too. And a crack in this or a collapsed fuel line will lead to problems that are real hard to find. Um, hard starting or not starting, uh, not performing right or starting and then dying again, number of things. So, well, I always, uh, on my saws and when we when we uh, service them in the shop, while we've got the fuel filter pulled out, I can look down inside the fuel tank and I can take a good look and, and reach in and pinch that fuel line to see if, it's, if it feels like it's a good tube and not real spongy like it might collapse. You'll actually feel them sometimes, you'll feel them pinch them together and they'll collapse and it'll be like they're, they're tacky almost, okay? So we'll check that. 
And then often I will, if there's any question, I will drain the fuel. And I do this for a number of reasons. Now I've popped the, the plug out for uh, kind of clarity and to, to see it, but I do that because otherwise it dangles down here and gets in the way. But I keep around a quart jar, a clear glass jar. Um, actually, this is a, a half quart of, uh, pint jar. Uh, because that's about all the fuel that's in these things. But I will dump all of that into a container because I want to check and see. First, I want to be able to look inside that tank and see if there's anything in there. And whether you do this before you pull the filter off or, or afterwards, I mean, it's, you know, six to one half dozen the other. But if I think there's any problems with it when I'm looking at that fuel, filter and, and um, fuel line, I will dump the fuel right now. And particularly if a customer comes in, they say it's hard starting. I can't get it started or it started and died. And all I did was put new fuel in. I go, ah, well, what's the difference? It ran good until you put new fuel in it. So it might be a fuel problem. So I'll dump that out. And I'll, I want to see what's in that fuel um, because there could be contamination inside that fuel. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about that in a couple of minutes here, because that's one of the big problems we find with, with occasional use saws that, in other words, not used every day, that we get contamination in our fuel supply system. And that transfers into the tank and then gets into the, the carburetor. So we'll dump that out into a clean container. If it's good gas, it goes back in. If it's not good gas, it goes in my recycled oil container for uh, a trip to the the waste transfer station and, and uh, where I dispose of my waste oil. Okay, so let's talk a bit about your fuel transfer tank or fuel mix tank, because that's the big point that we find contamination getting in into our, our uh, chainsaws. Um, probably most of you mix your gas in a, a can like this, and because we it's, it is mixed fuel, in other words, it's, it's a two cycle oil design for these handheld power tools and our gasoline, we mix it in a container. That container uh, should be properly marked uh, that says uh, uh, chainsaw gas or two cycle gas or whatever. This doesn't happen to be marked on the front side where I can usually see it. Um, and this is, this is the mix so what it should look like. It doesn't have to be dark like that. My particular oil I use is dark colored. Others are blues and you'll see a blue in here in a minute. Some is green, some is light yellow. It's all different manufacturers use different color uh, uh, for their two cycle. It's almost a trademark thing, but I want to look in the bottom of that and make sure there's no contamination. Now, this is a sample that I took out of a, a saw. Um, I think about six months ago when the, the story was just like I related to you. The guy said it ran fine. I've been using it. Uh, I put new gas in it, uh, all of a sudden it wouldn't, it ran and then it died and I can't get it started. And so I said, well, what's the difference? What did you do different? Well, all I did different was put new gas in it. So I, first thing I did is dump the gas out and there it was right there. This is the gas, that's water, okay? So that water came out of this tank. And the way it gets in there is by condensation. And it doesn't happen all at once or overnight unless you let this sit out in the rain with a cap off of it or something. And you can get water inside the tank. But most commonly, because you're not going to use, this is a two gallon container. You're not going to use two gallons in one day. You're going to use two gallons maybe over two months or maybe even six months. And during that time, that container is gradually getting empty as you... Um, or using it as you're filling your saw or your weed eater or whatever else you use, because this same mix works in, in all of your two cycle handheld power tools and you're getting more and more air in here. And, and, and during the day when this, especially if this is out in a warm area, that air heats up and is forced out the top. And then at night, cool air comes back in and that cool air is laden with moisture. And then the next day when it heats up again, that hot air is driven out, but that hot air leaves behind the moisture and that moisture settles to the bottom of the container. And over time, you start building up and getting a whole bunch of water condensed in here. And as you tip this can up over the top of that saw, particularly as you empty this can, the last little bit of this can goes into your saw, all of that gets dumped into your saw, okay? With the result is it gets sucked up into your carburetor and, and hopefully it doesn't stay in the carburetor. We can clean it out and, and, and get you back running again. Um, but uh, that's the big problem is condensation. So one of the ways you can avoid that is by keeping this, never leaving it right out in the sun for a long period of time. I keep mine in, in my shed in a cool area. If I take it out, uh, I actually use a one gallon container. I mix it two and a half gallons and I use a one gallon container uh, that I take out. I'll, one of my last slides, you'll see my little saw box set up. Uh, 
So I'm not exposing all of that to uh, sunlight, heating and cooling all the time and condensation. The other thing I do is I never ever, and this goes for my tractors and things too. I never ever dump, tip this can up completely to empty the last of it into a unit. In other words, I'll, I'll drain, I'll keep using it until I get down to in here someplace. So there's like a, a quarter of a gallon left or something. And then I will check that in a clear container and see if it's good or not. If it's good, it goes in the saw. If it's not good, like I said, it goes into my, into my uh, uh, recycle oil for disposal. And then I start over again with a, with a fresh mix. So um, yeah. There's another sample right there. Here's a, this is a different sample. Uh, this is what it should look like, should be clear. That's what I took out of my saw the other day when I was filming and trying to put together this, this little video or demonstration. This is one that I did uh, like last week in our, our shop at work, a little bit of oil in the bottom and that's enough. When your oil gets down near the, or your, your gas gets down near the bottom of the tank, that's enough to cause problems in your saw, okay? And often there'll be a little chips and sawdust and other stuff in there. So when I see that, I always flush the tank totally on a, on a customer saw. Excuse me, I got to get a drink of water here. Okay, um, let's see. My next, yeah, so I'm going to stop right there for a minute and just ask if anybody has any questions about, about fuel uh, problems. We're going to talk about specifically about mixing it and what type of fuel to use later. But does anybody have any questions right now about about what I just said about this about the the contamination and checking things in the uh, uh, we, fuel tank? We have a question a little bit back further about replacing the fuel line. The question um, yeah. from Suzanne is: Is replacing the fuel line an owner fix or is it a trip to the shop? Oh, and there's another question coming in. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of room in there to manipulate. So we'll start with that one. And then there's a second question coming in as well. Yeah, that's true. There's not a lot of room to manipulate. Let me get back to a picture here uh, back if I can that might show where we're going to be at. <clears throat> yeah, OK. Uh, let's see, one more, one more slide, one more slide. Okay, yeah, so, so that fuel line uh, goes through the tank and it comes up through a little grommet underneath and it's gonna come up and this is the bottom end of it right here. Uh, where you can see my cursor is underneath the carburetor. So yeah, there's not a lot of line. And to answer your question, um, is that a, a owner fix or a service department fix? I, I, I'm gonna say that depends on how confident you are in your mechanical abilities. Would you replace say the fuel pump on your car or you take it to a service dealer and have that done? Um, it's not hard. It's about a half hour thing. We have to take the carburetor apart, which means or out, which means uh, disconnecting all the linkage down. You're pulling all this the choke linkage and throttle linkage and things out. The carburetor comes out, it slides right out. Uh, there's two nuts right here, one each side. It slides right out. Uh, disconnect the fuel line and the pulsation tube, which is underneath, and then uh, of course draining the fuel tank and then getting the fuel line, the old fuel line. Uh, we can pull it right out, and then. Um, inserting the new fuel line and the trick is in getting it in the position it was in before because there's a, a forward and a backward thing and it also it has a little grommet that you have to force through the opening without poking a hole in your fuel line so it, for me it's an easy fix uh, for you if you're if you're mechanically inclined it's an easy fix but it's not that difficult in our shop it's something we do all the time and it's not that expensive a fix i can put a new fuel line and fuel lines run about between seven and fifteen dollars, depending upon the make and model of of uh, your saw, and um, it's about a half hour fix. So we'll say forty bucks for service plus the parts. So that's not uh, that big of a thing to get your saw back in running condition. So and, and then the other part of the question was what? The well, there was a second question, which okay. is, um, do you use a fuel treatment? Um, Yes and no. Um, and I'll talk more about that when we get to fuels, but just briefly, I use a, uh, and we recommend in our shop uh, for all of our new stuff going out and even old stuff, we recommend a, a two cycle oil that has, uh, it, we're actually that still is trying to switch over to synthetic oil. It burns much better and cleaner in the engine, so it's an air emission standard thing, but it also has a stabilizer in it, so it stabilizes the fuel for long-term storage. The other thing is the type of fuel you use. Uh, we also recommend an ethanol-free rather than ethanol fuel. 
uh, and I'll, again, I'll talk about that more under under uh, fuel and you know, mixing our fuel, which is going to come up here pretty quick. So, okay. Did um, I answer your questions? Uh, uh, there's questions two answered. more questions that came okay. in. Uh, yeah. One is how do you flush the tank? And I'm not sure if they mean the portable tank or the, the tank within the saw. Okay, so uh, let's do both of them. Okay, so how do I flush this tank? When I get to this point, this is the saw tank, I'll dump it out and I'll look back inside with my little flashlight. I get a real strong little uh, streamlight flashlight. I look back inside and I see any water and you can see water easily because uh, it'll be a little puddle underneath whatever is left in there. Also, if I see any, um, you know, like sawdust and residue in there. So what I'll do is I'll take some clean fuel for my shop and I'll dump inside there and I'll swirl it around and I'll dump it out again into my, my container here. I'll just tip it up and dump it all out and see if that got it all out. If not, um, I've actually got a syringe, large syringe with a tube on it. I go in and I'll aspirate that stuff out um, and suck that stuff right out of the tank. Uh, for as far as the my can, this, how do I clean it? I just tip it up right side up, upside down over a, a container and dump everything out of it. Then I look inside and make sure everything's cleaned out. So, okay. yeah, and that's, it's really pretty simple. Okay. okay. Um, last question is, what pre -mixed, else? is pre-mixed fuel in quart cans good to use? Yes, and I'm going to cover that when I get to it. Um, so, yeah, if I can hold that question for, for a few minutes, because I'm going to talk specifically about pre-mixed fuel. Okay? okay. All right. Perfect. Looks like okay. we're good. Okay, so let's see. We already looked at that. We looked, okay, so now a service kit. Here's your Warner Damage Parts thing. Uh, we sell service kits, and most, most of the major saw companies do. Um, the service kit, these are like $18 and $17.99 is what ours cost. They contain a new air filter, spark plug, and fuel filter for that model saw. I think we've got about, for the family of saws, we've got about uh, eight, I think, different kits for different families of saws. And this goes for our trimmers and our blowers also. Um, and uh, the, you can, you just get it and take it home and you can do, I just showed you all the things to do on that. It's about a 15 minute operation to, to replace all those things. If you don't feel comfortable with that or you want us to do other things, when we do a tune up, that's what we do. The things I just showed you all the way through to this point, and then replacing these parts. That's that's a standard tune up. And then we start it and run it and make sure it runs correctly with, with fresh fuel in it. And um, we also uh, then we'll tune the carb if it needs it. And carbs do not need tuning as often as you would think. Okay, really, once you replace these parts and get fresh fuel in, nine times out of ten, it's good to go. Okay. Okay, now let's. Next one, the chain break. Okay, and you want to check the chain break for operation. I do that with the engine running. You have to. Well, you can do it with it on and off. First of all, I'll pop it on the chain break up here with it pulled back. Okay, it's off. In other words, the chain can move freely. With it popped forward, the chain break is on. And this is an inertia break. In other words, if you slam that saw down quickly on the ground, that thing can set. It can snap forward. And there's a little popping sound when it. When, when the mechanism in here over centers between off and on. So you'll know whether it's off or on. And then I'll take my hand and I'll, because my chains are sharp and, and I usually have sharpened them at this point too. Uh, with a gloved hand, I'll, I'll roll the chain forwards and backwards and it should roll freely. Okay, and then I'll start the saw up and I'll run it up to near full throttle and I'll pop that handle ahead with my hand and that chain should stop just like that. Okay, if it doesn't, there's something wrong with it. And that's, again, that's a safety thing. It's kind of like checking the brakes on your car or your truck before you start going someplace or your trailer, if you're pulling a trailer. It's just one of those things you do every time you, you uh, service your, your unit to make sure it's gonna work, okay? All right, and the reason you check your chain break is so this doesn't happen, and this can happen. Kickbacks will happen. We'll talk more about them, but you want that chain to stop before it comes up and bonks you in the noggin. Now, it may take up a little skin off your forehead, or if you've got a hard hat on, give you a little bruise, but it's not going to carve its way into your family memories, so which chains can do in a hurry. And chainsaw injuries, folks, are nasty, nasty things. They don't make a cut like a knife. They saw or grind, I guess we'll call it, a groove through whatever part of your body they touch and the remainder of what they've touched is on the ground in a bloody mess. 
So you want to make sure uh, this will help. And, and, and here's what a chain break does. And notice the way he's got this held. He's property holding it left hand with his thumb wrapped around the upper handle, right hand on the, the operating handle and the trigger. And this happens, by the way, faster than you can get your hand off the trigger. Okay? It's, it's way too quick. So as this chain saw rotates up, your hand rotates, your left hand rotates around this upper handle just by pure force, and your wrist comes in contact with that chain brake handle, snapping it forward. And that stops the chain like that. So it's a stopped chain that comes in contact rather than a moving chain that's going to sign you. Okay? All right. And I can't, I can't, um, I guess, uh, express the importance of, of maintaining that chain break. And, and I say that because some of my saws, now chain breaks have only been required actually for the last 30 some years. So some of my saws don't have chain breaks and I have to be especially careful on them um, that, I, that I don't get in the kickback situation because actually they're my bigger and more powerful saws and can do some real damage. But all new saws, all saws in the last, I'll say 20 to 25 years, are required to have a chain break that functions on them, okay? Of all makes, it's not just still. Okay, so another thing I'll do when I replace the chain is I, now this is the same saw, like five minutes apart, still, upside down still, flip the bar over. Every time I take my chain off, for whatever reason, whether to do my daily service to clean it, or if I put a new chain on, uh, to replace the dull chain, I flip the bar over because the bar is the same on both sides. When we sell the saws, we always install them with still right side up, but the other side is just as good. And that doubles the life of your, of your bar, okay? Bars cost about $3 per working inch. So this is a, um, let's see, that's my 044. So that's a 28 inch bar. So we're looking at around uh, $90 for that, to replace that bar, that chain is about $40, uh, 35, I think, to replace that chain. So um, I want to make sure I get all the life out of this uh, bar and, of course, the chain that I can. Okay, so flip the bar over every time you replace it, every time you take the chain off. Uh, you're putting it back on. Just notice how, wh which way the, the, the words, whether it's Steel or Oregon or Husqvarna or whatever brand is, doesn't matter. You'll see it right side up or one side, flip it over and, and put it up the other way when you replace it. Okay, installing the chain on the bar. Okay, so here's something that um, I want to say politely. Um, we get a lot of chains brought in by people that are not familiar with their saw that the bar, the chain is on backwards. Okay, and the, the proper way is the chain with the cutters on the bottom of the saw or the bar face toward the saw engine. They're facing back towards you because that's the way it's cutting. You run the saw up against the wood and then it cuts uh, coming towards you on the bottom. Now, if you cut with the top of the bar, which can be done and, and is done in some like bucking situations or limbing, you're cutting with the top of the bar and the, the teeth are cutting away from you. Okay, that's the proper way it goes on. Okay, so place the chain on there correctly and on the on the uh, dry sprockets and those sprockets to make sure it's in the, the uh, groove on the on the bar and then place your side cover nuts on the bar studs, just finger tighten them. And then we're going to hold the bar tip up and tighten the tension screw until the chain just comes up to touch the bottom and then we'll retension it and adjust it. And that's going to look like this. Okay, we need to hold the end of the bar up either with your fingers or I put a block of wood under it a lot of times in my longer bars because there's a little wiggle. This end of this bar will wiggle up and down about an inch before you start tightening it up, okay? With it down, it's a different slack than with it's up. And its natural cutting position is with it pushed up because that's the way the engine's kind of pushed down onto it. So always hold that bar tip up when you are adjusting the tension, either by placing it on a block of wood or up your fingers. And this is an untensioned chain. Now, if you're running the chain saw at that point, when you, the drivers are out of the groove, I would stop and retension the chain. Okay, uh, but this is we're just putting it on. So, and we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and start tensioning it by either tightening that screw or the toolless connector that I showed you uh, earlier back on the side cover or on the front of the saw. We're gonna start turning that, and it's gonna push the bar outwards. Gonna push the bar away from the saw, and as it does that, it will break. This will come up. 
okay, less and less and less until it's just snug up against the bottom of the bar. And then up, while I'm still holding up the end of the bar, I'm gonna reach over here and just carefully pull that chain down and let it go. And it should just lightly snap up against the bar bottom. That's the right tension right there. We don't wanna tighten it too tight because that puts um, extra wear on the engine bearings and on the bar tip. We don't want it too tight. This would be okay to run. I would, when I, as long as I'm tightening it, I'll go a little tighter than that, but this is a little too loose, okay? All right. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop again. Is there any questions at this point, what I said about anything? Yes, um, so we have the um, uh, question earlier about pre-mixed fuel. You're still getting to that, I'm right? To that. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question about fuel, uh, commenting on, do you have any comments on safety around gasoline during inspection and flushing? And yeah, then, well, and then yeah. we have a question about chain brakes. Okay, all right. So let's take the one about safety first. Um, I don't smoke, never have. Um, but if you do, uh, don't smoke around. It's the same precautions as you see posted at your service station when you fuel your gas up. The saw engines shut off. There's no sparks or open flame around it. That kind of thing. And of course, I always do this out in the ventilated area outside my shop or I'm out in the woods when I fuel up. I don't because of the uh, gas vapors. Uh, not only are they not good to breathe, but of course, if you're inside the shop and get gasoline vapors, there's always the chance you could have that spark. So yeah, that's the big thing is out away from uh, the engine shut off, no smoking, no open flames, no, you know, if, uh, if I'm around the shop, we're not grinding right there on chains or anywhere right where we're, we're refueling. Um, okay, and did that answer that question? I believe so. And then um, with the, will the chain break ever need user maintenance or calibration? Um, Typically, no, no, there's nothing to really adjust. They can wear out. I'll show you what happens if you try to run it with a chain break on. I've got a quick slide here in a couple of minutes about that. Uh, but there's really nothing you can do because there's, while there are some wear parts in there, there's nothing that can be adjusted um, on, that's on steel saws or any chain, any make of, that I've ever seen. There's no way to adjust any of these things. It's simply they work or they don't work. If they don't work, there's something broken, okay? Okay, I think okay. that's it for now. All right, so let's get on to um, the fuel and bar oil because those are your lubricants in the engine. So um, this is our display at our at our shop of uh, uh, these are two cycle. This is these are the mineral oils, the traditional oils that have been used for the last sixty or so years. The chainsaws have been in existence. <clears throat> actually closer to 80 years now, I think. <clears throat> these are the new ultra, they call them. These are synthetic oils that, that has just come out and all brands, uh, Husqvarna, uh, John's Red, uh, Plan, I believe also has some in steel. They, they all coming out with synthetic oil because for a couple of reasons, one of the reasons is synthetic oils burn much cleaner in our two cycle and cleaner than the mineral oils. So you get less fouling of your spark plug. Um, and since it burns cleaner, that means you have less emissions going out in the atmosphere and air emission standards drives everything, whether it's your car, a jet engine or your lawnmower or chainsaw today. So, so the manufacturers are real keen on cutting air emissions. So using a synthetic oil does that. Also the synthetic oil um, works better, it lubricates better as, in, as engines run hotter and our modern engines run a lot hotter than they did years ago. Plus these little engines run a lot hotter than say your, your lawnmower engine or something. So it, it works, it lubricates better in them. And also in the, the synthetic oil and steel synthetic oil, there is a stabilizer added to it. So if you're leaving your saw set for six months, you don't, it, it kind of helps prevent the, the gasoline in it from oxidizing. So there's a number of benefits to that. And it's a little more expensive, I think, I think it's um, like 80 cents. You compare the cost of this one to, to this one. That's our gallon mix. It's about 80 cents different. But for that difference in a gallon, uh, you're, it, the benefits far outweigh the, the detractors. And I, I've also, I've kind of, I'll say, switched over all of my units. And I've got, um, oh, golly, I don't know, a couple of trimmers, actually a little rototiller that runs on two cycle, all my nine saws, a blower, I don't know what else. Uh, all of them, uh, I use the same mix. It's a 50 to one mix. I use all of that in them now. 
um, and my mineral oil I've given away. Uh, I had a couple of cans of it left and <clears throat> gave it away because I just run the synthetic. It just works so much better for me. And, and having seen what it does from a technician standpoint, I, I just really like it. Um, it comes in various sizes. This is a one gallon mix. So all of that goes in one gallon. Those are two gallon mixes. These are two and a half. Those are five gallon mixes. And you can actually buy it in, in buckets. that will mix a whole 55 gallon barrel full. Uh, um, but most people, of course, aren't going to go to that extent. But what you want to do is you want to mix the amount of fuel that you're going to use in a reasonable amount of time. So I try to mix this what I'm going to use in, in uh, about 60 to 90 days. Uh, otherwise, the oil or the, the gasoline gets starts getting stale. Uh, it, the light fractions evaporate off and, and just makes it a little harder to start and harder to run. You get a little less energy out of your gasoline. So um, while I might burn five gallons of gasoline in a... Um, you know, in a, a three or four month period, I mix mine two and a half gallons at a time. Uh, all of this goes in two and a half gallons. Now, we do have some people that they look at the price of this. They'll actually, they're usually down on this shelf. They look at the price of this. They look at the price of a five gallon. I can mix five gallons. I can save about 80 cents by buying this over five of these. Problem is these are weighed and calibrated to go all in one gallon or all in two gallons. And when you start trying to pour that out into a measuring cup or into an old container, um, and I've got one person that I work with a lot that does this all the time and his complaint is always the same thing. He fouls up his plugs and fouls up his, um, his uh, muffler exhaust system by over mixing um, because he can't get the correct mix and, and that is not as big a da danger as not getting enough in there because this is all the lubrication that engine gets folks that's it right there and these things run at about 13,000 rpm and they're under heavy load running near maximum full power when you're in a, when you're cutting in a piece of wood and if that lubrication fails to lubricate and i'll show you in a couple of minutes uh, what happens with that but it's not pretty for the engine and it's always expensive for the owner so so don't don't try to save a few cents by pouring out five one gallon mixes out of this. Just go ahead and buy your six pack. Actually, it's about the same cost as one of those anyway um, of, uh, of your oil because all of this goes in one gallon or two and a half gallons or whatever size mix you want. Okay. Uh, this is bar oil down on the bottom. I'm going to talk about bar oil separately in a minute. Okay, so chainsaws are two cycle engines. That means the piston moves up and down once, crank goes around one time and it, you get a power stroke out of it. And to do that, there's no oil in the engine other than what we put in with the gasoline, okay? So they must have a properly mixed two cycle oil with the gasoline. We use only two cycle mix recommended for handheld power tools. Do not try to use um, oil for an outboard motor because they run slower, they're water cool. There's a lot different operating conditions than what our handheld power tools are. And when I say handheld power tools, I'm talking about your portable blowers, your chainsaws, your string trimmers, et cetera. Um, hedge cutters, uh, hedge trimmers also fall in that category. Uh, and most of the current ratio, uh, most current production engines use a 50 to one gas to oil ratio, okay? Uh, 25 or 30 years ago, they were 41. And I remember back when I first started running chainsaws in the early 1960s, they were at a 25 to one and you had a fog of oil, a smoke, blue smoke. You didn't have to worry about mosquitoes uh, being around you at that time, I'll tell you. And then as far as what uh, rating of gasoline, all engine manufacturers, and this includes lawnmower, the four cycle manufacturers, they all recommend at least an 89 octane gas, okay? 89 octane gas and your regular grade at the pump is 87. Uh, so 89 or 91 or 92 of the premium uh, is what you want to put in these things. And then a maximum of 10% ethanol. We don't have to worry about that around here because I think the Puget Sound Air Pollution Control Authority has mandated a maximum of 10. In some parts of the country, it is more than 10. Um, I prefer to run ethanol free, which is a little harder to find sometimes, but, and I'll go into that a little more. I'll, I'll talk about it right now. Um, ethanol is, is alcohol. It uh, uh, is an oxidizer in the, in the fuel. So it burns cleaner in the engine. It, it reduces some of the nitrous oxide emissions. And it's, it's about your emission standards again. And it's okay in your car because you are refueling your car every week or every two weeks or every three weeks or stuff. So it doesn't set in your car very long. Plus most of your cars have a little more complex fueling system than does the these chainsaws or, or hedge trimmers or weed eaters, whatever. Um, 
So it really doesn't bother me much, but what happens when you left, leave, leave this 10% ethanol sitting in your uh, chainsaw and you use it, say, for spring cleanup, and then you don't use it again until so far, some, some wood cutting in, in August or September, it's sitting around for six or eight months, um, and that starts doing bad things inside of your, of your fuel system. I already talked about what it does to the fuel lines, for example, if it sits inside your carburetors. There's a couple of diaphragms inside your carburetor that, that uh, phenolic diaphragms, that it'll just... Uh, harden them up and, and they'll get brittle and won't work properly. So um, I prefer to use uh, non-ethanol. Now, having said that, if what you can get is ethanol free, fine. But remember when you get done with that, you're gonna let it store for a while, get it all out of the engine. Uh, start the engine up, warm it up, uh, shut it off, dump the old fuel back out in your storage container and start the engine again. It'll start when it's warm on what residual fuels in your fuel line, run it until it runs dry. That'll clean out all the, uh, fuel out of your system and then it's safe to store and your chances of it starting up when you on the first or second pull next spring when you put new fuel in it are a lot greater than if you let that fuel set in your system all winter. Okay and we talked about the difference between uh, synthetic oil and, and mineral base. Okay I don't I'm not going to belabor that point anymore so unless somebody has any questions about that I'm going to uh, keep moving. Um, there were a couple of questions, Steve. Um, so let's see, you haven't gotten to the pre-mixed, right? Yeah. I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about the technique in my next slide of, of the mixing. Uh, okay. And then I'll come and, to pre-mix right down the road real quick like. Yep. Okay. And then another question is, are there any problems that could be caused by changing between, changing back and forth between synthetic and mineral oils? Mm -mm. No, it's just you don't have the benefit of the synthetic oil and the mineral oil. They're basically the same uh, design for the same engines is, is the big thing. Uh, uh, once I started on the synthetic, I just stayed with synthetic. Yeah. And I usually buy mine in a six pack. So um, I've always got an extra can or two on hand. So it's not like I'm going to run out on a Sunday and not have gas usually. So, okay. Hey, that's it for now. All right. Okay, and as I said, do not use a two cycle mix designed for outboard engines or snowmobiles or whatever else because they operate in a they, they got di entirely different lubrication requirements in their engine, and you will not be very happy running this in your your chainsaw. Uh, they'll they'll cause some faster um, wear in the engine. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Okay, all right, and we talked about the difference between ethanol gas and and non ethanol. Um, Eth uh, let me just uh, talk, uh, tell you what I do. Um, I go to my bulk oil plant here in Arlington. It's uh, Nelson Petroleum. I think up in Skagit County. I know my son goes to, both my sons live up there and they go to Skagit Farmers. They can get ethanol free there. Uh, I've been east of the mountains in Ellensburg and there are pumps right there at, at uh, the, the Petrocard stations have ethanol free because so many guys use it in their small engines. Um, it's just a little harder to find. Um, I know there is some on uh, Island Crossing here in Arlington, right off I-5 uh, I five and 530. The tribal uh, refueling point there has it, but they're only an 87 octane. So I want to use, I want to use a higher, I prefer the 92 octane ethanol free gas with a synthetic oil. And that works really well. I use that in all of my handheld power tools. Um, and I just really have no problems. I also use the 92 octane, just the straight gas in my four cycle engines of which I've got about 18 or 19 from a portable welder and an air compressor and a wood splitter and a generator and a couple lawnmowers and rototiller and so on. And, and I find that that 92 octane ethanol free um, for the, it's like 80 cents a gallon more expensive than the pump gas. I might get the 89 ethanol pump gas. Um, but I just don't have any problems with it sitting for long periods of time. I put some stable in it over winter um, when I'm uh, in my four cycle engines um, to help prevent oxidation. But things just, I, I have to work on everybody else's engines. I don't like to have to work on mine too. And this doing this kind of thing, the little extra expense of the synthetic mix and the 92 octane ethanol free just uh, stops a lot of problems in my in my engines and most of your problems in your engines you have around are going to be fuel related okay um, so buy fresh fuel um, 
and as I said, don't buy more than what you can reasonably use. Now, when you get to 90 days, it's not like um, the milk in your refrigerator, you got to throw it out or whatever. It's, it's that's approximately 90 days. Um, and then, you know, use it in a, in a reasonable amount of time and check your storage container for contamination. We talked about that by dumping it into a, into a container and then store it in a cool shaded area. We also talked about that. Okay, um, and then here's different size containers. So you can, you know, there's five, two and a half and one gallon containers. So you, you know, buy what you need and just use, have that amount on hand. Um, let me jump down to one more slide here. So there's your mixed fuel. This is Stills Moto Mix. It's a 93 octane synthetic oil mix, 50 to one. Uh, when still, uh, I'll say cans it when they seal it, they store it under nitrogen. So it has a shelf life of five years until you open it. And it's two years of shelf life after that, uh, partly because of the synthetic oil has a stabilizer in it. So and it's really great for the occasional user or when you don't want to mess with mixing or getting gas. Um, the disadvantage is it is expensive. A gallon of this stuff is runs around $32. But if you're only going to use a quart and then not use any for a long time, uh, it's probably worth it. And we also sell a lot of this to different agencies. I know the uh, PUD here in town and I'm one of the fire departments, they come by this because they've got four cycle engines like generators and blowers and things on their rigs. And they've also got chainsaws and cutoff saws and things on their rigs that are two cycle. And they don't wanna worry about somebody getting the wrong gas. Because if you put straight gas into a, uh, for two cycle engine to run it, that's what happens. And that was a slide I said I was gonna show you. That is a piston that ran about less than 15 minutes in a two cycle engine without the proper lubricating oil in it. And that's exactly what happens. The piston was actually welded. You can see it. It's the melt the piston smeared right across the piston ring pair job on that particular unit. And the whole unit only cost about 600. So we just said, you make the choice. And of course they decided not to go for the repair job, but I did save the parts. So yeah, this is good stuff. There's also another one called True Fuel, which is marketed by Ace Hardware and other places. Uh, same kind of thing, it's a couple bucks cheaper, but those things really work great. I actually, this is actually my can, that one was full. When I go hunting every year, I take my saw with me. I don't wanna take my big saws. All I needed if we get, have a windstorm like we did a couple of years ago and it blows down trees on the road. Um, so we can cut our way in or out, usually have to cut it out. And so I just think that I'll buy one of those things. Hopefully, if I can't get the job done in that, it's probably not going to happen anyway. Um, so, uh, and, and I say, if I go ahead and use it, then uh, I'll use it. If not, um, I'll use it next year. Okay. And after a couple of years of, of not using it, I'll go ahead and dump it in and buy another can. So, yeah, th this pre mix fuel is a really good idea. And I, I like it a lot. Um, it, it's got all the stuff you want in it. So, it doesn't really cause. Uh, I mean, it's just expensive, a little more expensive, but for you, occasional user, uh, it's a great way to go because you don't have to have a separate can. You don't have to have the, buy the premix. You don't have to run around and buy, try to find the ethanol free at a, at a uh, service point and so on. So it's a really good way to when you consider what your time is worth. It's a good way to go. Um, so just back up a little bit about the proper mixing technique. So first thing you want to do if you're mixing it in the container, you want to fill your, your mixing can about a quarter full. So it's a two and a half gallon can. I'll put, uh, you know, a couple of three quarts out of the nozzle into the can. And then I'm going to pour my two cycle oil mix into the gasoline and I'm going to swirl it around and kind of mix that oil and the gasoline together, make kind of a slurry. If I just dump the oil into the can first, that oil is really sticky and if it sticks to the bottom of the can, it may not get mixed well. And like I said, this is the only lubrication that engine gets. So I wanna make sure I've got it thoroughly mixed and every bit of it is in solution in that, in that uh, fuel. And then I'll go ahead and fill the container at the proper level. And then each time I pick my can up, it's just a habit, I shake or, or stir the can, just shake it around a bit to make sure it's thoroughly mixed and I'm getting all the oil the 50 to one ratio into that, okay? Now, like I said, that will ensure the proper mix. All right, now, did I answer the, the, the person's question about this? Is that? Yes, yeah, their question was specifically, what do you think about the pre-mixed fuel? So, yeah. I, really yeah. Like, I don't use it myself, other than, like I said, I, I buy some to take hunting because I only want a small amount. I don't want to take my big can with me. And I think it's a really great way to go. Um, 
And, and if I wasn't selling the stuff in the store, I would still think that just because it's for a small quantity that you, that stays, let's say five years until you open it because it's under nitrogen and then two years after that, you can't beat that, okay, for value. Um, one other person mentioned that they sometimes use canola oil. Do you have thoughts on that? Uh, all right, I've never seen that in our literature. Um, I, I don't know how that would react in the engine. I'm familiar with canola oil as used as a biofuel, uh, mainly in diesels, but I'm not familiar with that as a substitute two cycle mix at all. So I, I really can't answer that question. I, I guess I, I have to say, I'd like to know more about it, but I, I really have not seen anything. Nothing's come across our desk from steel or any other manufacturer. And in my experience with engines, I've not seen that as a two cycle mix, okay? Sorry, I can't answer that one. Yeah, that's okay. And then there were just a couple of shout outs that the Snohomish Co-op sells ethanol free premium um, gas, so. Uh, okay, as a so much go up to it. So is, is what is the ethanol rating on that one? Um, let's see here. Or excuse me, the octane rating. Is it like a 92? Oh, they, they mentioned premium, so I would guess it'd be 92, but they, gotcha. the commenter did not say whether what the octane rating was. Okay, very good. Yeah, so I don't know all the places I'm shopping Snohomish because I'm up north. I'm north of Arlington, actually almost on the Skagit County line. So uh, I shop in Arlington or, or north or, or most of my, my stuff. So I do know where I buy my fuels and is, <clears throat> excuse me, in Arlington, the bulk plant. Uh, for Nelson Petroleum, and I would imagine other bulk plants around, there's several around the area in Skagit, Snohomish, Schwatkin County, you'll, you'll find those same kinds of things. Just talk to the, the guys and the folks in there, they can tell you what they've got, okay? All right, and I showed you that, that was a, that was a oh, oops, that was an oops, okay? All right, and then so filling your saw tank with gas, so uh, you want to make sure you clean off, and this is when I have the saw at the shop, so if I'm cleaning it off there, I'm blowing it off, getting it clean. If I'm in the field or if I'm uh, uh, out in my trailer or something where I'm out cutting firewood, I'll wipe that off, even just my hand or blowing it off, because I don't want to get contamination into that fuel tank. So clean that off. I will then open the fuel cap. Some of the caps uh, you open either by hand or if they're on tight, you have to take a screwdriver, your scrunch to loosen it with. A lot of the newer units have a toolless type cap, open that. Uh, and as, if you got that area cleaned off around them, nothing's gonna fall inside the tank. When you re-tighten these things, folks, well, they only need to be hand tight. Um, if you tighten it back with your scrunch, if you tighten it hand tight and it's leaking, uh, come in or get a, a, either a new cap or a new seal. There's an O-ring underneath of these things can be replaced quickly and economically. You shouldn't have to snug them down uh, butt tight with a wrench to keep them from leaking. Okay? And Because what happens is these tanks and the caps are plastic and they often start with age. And this particular saw is only about eight years old. A lot of my, most of my saws are much older and you can actually crack that tank by putting too much force on it. So hand tight's all it should be. And I say, if it leaks, then get a new O-ring. These guys have O-rings too. And they're, um, if anybody has a steel that they have experienced problems with these things, uh, mine is one of the old style of caps. The new ones have a little black line on the top up here and we can replace those. They're about eight bucks for a new cap. They don't have the problems. The first generation had some, some problems with them, okay? And then I'll, I'll pour it in if I'm, uh, and I've got a funnel, my funnel has a little screen in it. You can pour it in without the funnel if you want, but I have a funnel because I'll slop sometimes. Um, and my funnel has a screen in it in the bottom. Uh, you can buy them at any hardware store that kind of helps prevent anything else from going inside of that, that tank. Okay, and I want to mention about electric saws for a minute because electric chainsaws are out there. Uh, they both ones that operate from 120 volt uh, wall current and ones that operate from battery packs and there you can buy them at all kinds of Lowe's and Home Depot or saw stores still has a full line of battery powered equipment. Um, they're getting very good. The batteries are getting very, very good. They work well for light stuff like pruning, de small debris removal. I sold a couple of the gentlemen that are in their 80s that ran saws in the woods. They can't start a saw anymore because they have shoulder problems, um, but they love that little electric saw because they can still go out and clean up some of their, their stuff. I was, I've got one I was cutting um, 
six inch diameter wood with it the other day because I was up on a ladder cutting some limbs, probably something I shouldn't have been doing, but I didn't want to take my gas off there. I was cutting some limbs off a big cedar tree. So uh, the advantage of these things, you're no messing with gasoline or storage. All you need to do is sharpen the chain and add borrow, the same as a gas unit. They're lightweight. Don't have to worry about starting. You hit the safety switch, start it up, and away you go. There's That's an MSA 140, it's called. It's a steel unit. There's the battery packs, a 36 volt battery. Uh, I know different companies make different volts, which you have to look as volts and amps because that's watts, which is your power. This one has a 12-inch bar, and it, it just cuts like a, like a son of a gun. And there's your chain break on it, too. Um, and bar nut and tensioner. And same lines as a regular saw, just gasoline power, OK? Okay, so let's talk about chain and bar lubrication. This is the hole for the chain and bar lube, and the chain oil, of course, is what lubricates the chain as it goes around, and the bar, sprocket nose, and the clutch. Um, and you want to use a uh, uh, Bar oil, not old engine oil. I had a saw come in the other day. They thought that was okay to put in. The problem is this chain moves at 60 miles an hour. And if you put something in there like an old in, an engine oil, even a new engine oil, it's all going to get slung off out here down to tip. And all the work is done right here at the bottom of the bar where you're cutting. So now you have no lubrication. Engine, uh, engine oil doesn't have tackiness to it. It, it, it doesn't stick and, and stay on things. Like bar oil, if you touch bar oil, um, It'll, it'll, it'll string. You can take your fingers like this and it'll string three or four inches apart sometimes. It's meant to do that so it clings on to the chain. It doesn't have to worry about combustion deposits and all that kind of stuff like engine oil does. So, and, and actually, you're not saving any money. Uh, really, it's the same cost as, as engine oil. So use borrow. Okay, um, I'm going to skip this one because I just said all those things. Here's, what, here's how it works in a chain. And these are new chains. And by the way, the new chains... Um, are designed to efficiently use less oil to do more lubrication than what we used to have. And, and a lot of that's because that oil ends up out in the environment. And by the way, there are bio oils that are made out of, uh, well, they have a stickiness added to it, a tackiness that helps stick on here. But you, first of all, and this is, I'm looking at the side that would be toward the oil hole, okay? And this little groove, picks up oil from the bar and forces it up into the rivets and the side straps to lubricate them. And then these little dimples on both sides pick up oil and carry it around the bar. So it's spread all around to deliver some of it to the sprocket nose and then brick, continue on back uh, the rest of the bar back to underside of the bar where you're doing all the cutting and then end up lubricating the, the uh, uh, dry sprocket and stuff under the clutch. So uh, it's, a, it's important they get oil because that's what what lubricates everything. Uh, oops, wrong way here. Okay, some of the older saws and bigger saws actually had a grease tip. This is my 075, it was a three foot bar. So it had a, a long bar, it had a little grease tip here. This is a, a ball bearing underneath on the sprocket. So that little hole right there, and you have a little grease gun like this, with a little nipple on it, and you put it in and give it three or four shots so you see grease ooze out here. And you need to do that about every four hours of heavy operation. Uh, probably, I don't know, many, most of you probably won't even encounter that, but just look and see if there's that little hole right there, and you can go to your, your saw dealer or hardware store. They don't all look like this. Some look like a big syringe, and it'll put a little bit of grease right into that sprocket nose. Okay, chains and bars. So this is our selection of chains and bars, uh, replacement chains and bars, and I'm going to talk real quick about, about um, the chains. There's a lot of different sizes of chains, but I'm going to say chain is chain. I can make a chain in my shop for a steel or a Husqvarna or a Plan or a McCullough or anything because there's only a few different pitches, gauges, and tooth styles. And if you have a Husqvarna or a Plan and you need a new chain, bring me the chain and I can make, it, make up the new one. What I really need to know is the chain pitch which is the length of the, the, the side straps, and these are common sizes. Um, Catherine, did, did they get the handout that came from, along with the class from uh, Cooperative Extension? Those should have been sent out to all attendees, yes. Okay. Can somebody mention in the chat if they received that? Mm, 
I'm not seeing. Okay. Ah, there we go. It was available for download. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, so my pro presentation is not going to be available in the same format. It's going to be the uh, the same format as I use for the in person ones, and it's a lot more comprehensive when it talks about change and stuff. It's basically this kind of stuff plus a whole lot more. So uh, you might and and this stuff is also in your owner's manual. So you might want to read that. But the thing I need to know to make up a change: the chain pitch, the the gauge or the driver thickness and then what kind of style and and then the number of drivers which is dictated by bar length so and that that's going to vary from even among the same family of saws within the same brand for example if i if you come in and tell me i've got an 032 still with a 20 inch chain and during the manufacturing time that varied slightly with what what they put on that so it's best if we just have um uh, and here's a, a samples of all the uh, many of the different kinds of chains okay, that are out there. Uh, here's the places you can find that information on the side of your bar. If your bar is new enough, it'll have all this information. There's the pitch. There's the gauge. There's the number of drivers. I know that I can make that up. Here's on a replacement box or the, the ready made chain loop. Um, Here's all that same information. There's pitch, gauge, and number of drivers. It tells you that it goes on either a 16 or an 18 inch bar. And there's some sharpening information down at the bottom. That's Steele's numbers right here and what kind of a tooth it is. Um, a lot of people, what they'll do when they get a new saw or even one of their older saws, it'll take a picture of this because everybody packs their camera everywhere. Take a picture of this, turn it up and show it to me. I say, ah, I got that right here. Or I can make that up. Give me about two minutes and I can make it up. Okay. So this is pitch. Uh, sometimes that information is on the this is distance between three rivets divided by two, okay? Um, and so, uh, and then it sometimes will be stamped right here on the side. Gauge is on the bottom of the drivers. And we have chains in already made up uh, packages. Typically, mostly it'll fit still, but sometimes there's some crosses between other brands. If not, we've got 100 foot rolls of this and a chain breaker and a rivet spinner, I can make it up, give me five minutes and I can have it made up for you and you're out the door. The big thing is, is having this back, bring your old chain, okay? Uh, throw it on the desk like this and I need a new chain. I said, let me count this and, and uh, I counted the drivers. I know I can look at it, take a quick look at it, know what the, spacing is the gauge and count the number of drivers i can make him another one and he's back at work so that's what i need to know to make a new chain uh, okay so let's talk about chain sharpening quickly um, so how fast a chain cuts is dependent upon um, how fast it's moving okay in other words how much engine power you've got and if you can keep that chain that that engine at full power in that cut. And the other thing is how sharp it is, okay? Uh, so no matter if, if a chain is razor sharp and if that chain's not moving, it's not cutting. And conversely, if that chain is moving like a bullet, if it's not sharp, it's not cutting. So those two things come together, okay? And it, cutting with a chainsaw should be fun, not hard work. And when you have to start working and pushing on the chain, uh, on the chainsaw and prying on it to get it to work, all you're gonna do is wear yourself out the chain and the saw prematurely. And this is an example of the kind of chips you should be getting off of your, off your sharpened chains, like that. Nice long chips. When you get real fine sawdust, then you've probably got a dull chain. Okay, and this is an example of a very dull chain. It's a rounded cutting edge. This is that same tooth about two minutes later after I sharpened it. Notice it's a nice sharp razor edge, no reflection off of it. Okay, here's another one. When you see that, that's dull sharp me now, because if you put that into the log, all you're gonna get is sawdust and a lot of frustration. You're gonna heat up, you're gonna cut poorly, you're gonna make uh, dull cutters, make crooked cuts in your log. Dull chains add extra effort to cutting, both for you and the saw. They heat up both the chain and the bar and burn the oil off it so you're not getting lubrication. It increases wear on both the bar and the saw, and I'll say you as well. Okay, this is our display of sharpening equipment. Uh, various types of things to use for sharpening. And there's a number of kinds of things you can use. Um, of course, machine sharpening. Uh, in our shop, we have electric grinders. I'll show you a couple pictures of those. There's also some handheld electric grinders. Steel makes one, Dremel tool has. Um, uh, you can use a Dremel tool, even an air die grinder. Um, 
and in, get the, the right diameter of uh, grinder bits to, to sharpen. Okay, I'll show you how to tell which size the right. There's hand sharpening, both with guides of various kinds, and it's the typical old handle with a file. Okay, here's your uh, electric. This is an Oregon brand. I think they run about 450 bucks. You can buy them from like Northern Tool or someplace like that. This is our steel one in action in the shop. It actually grinds the chain. Uh, there's no difference between sharpness of a ground chain and a file chain, in my opinion. The advantage of a ground chain is I have to do 10 or 15 or 20 chains a day, and I'd wear a lot of files in my arms if I had to put that many strokes to get that file or that chain dull or excuse me, sharp again. That's extremely dull, and it would take probably 15 or 20 strokes on each tooth to get that sharp again. So we use a grinder like this so we can do her real quick and clean it up and get a good sharp cut and the other advantage of these machines is all of this stuff right in here that little thing right there and all these angles and things you said that are gauging so that every tooth is exactly the same angle and exactly the same length and that's really important for cutting straight because if you're cut your saw starts cutting like this that means one side of your chain is sharper than the other, okay? And you need, or longer or something, because once, uh, here's some example, this is Steel's little handle, and this happens to work on a 12 volt battery, because it, uh, you can hook it onto your tractor or your pickup when you're out in the woods. It has a little bit out here that goes down in the cutter, and it has, actually has a gauge on it that you put parallel with your, your um, cutter bar. Uh, like I say, Dremel tool, and there's a couple of others that make ones like that. Um, I particularly don't like those because there's no way to really gauge how much you're taking off of a tooth, and they can be real aggressive, and you have to be really careful in, in taking too much tooth off um, because you're going to, you know, prematurely lose life of that of that chain if you take too much off, and it's really easy to get teeth of different shapes and angles with them. Uh, here's a filing gauge. This was made by Oregon again. So I think they cost about forty or fifty bucks. This clamps onto your saw, and it has the right angles and the gauges. It just takes a little practice to get it on the saw. But the nice thing about it is every tooth comes out the same when you're done. Once you've figured out how it all works, and here's a couple of other things. This is Steel's two-in-one cutter raker file. It files the cutters and the rakers uh, at the same time. I'll explain the rakers in a minute. Here's another little handy file. This one has, it holds it in the right depth. It has lines on it. I'll show you that uh, in my next slide or two here that you line up. And here's just the, the three pack of files with a file and a handle. You always wanna put a handle on your file because those tangs down here are kind of sharp and they'll wear a blister on your hand real quick. So, and here's a, here's a toolkit that has the file and guide and a raker file and the tool for checking the depth of the rakers, which you have to do, particularly if you filed a lot of, of um, tooth off or every four or five filings, you want to check that. Uh, nice thing about hand filing is this totally for, field portable, okay? It requires some practice, and of course it is inexpensive. Um, all, all filing, uh, regardless of what you do, whether you're grinding or whatever, you find the dullest tooth first. I mark that, uh, and I start from there. I get my gauges set up, so I'll grind that one sharp or file that one sharp, and then I sharpen every tooth, the rest of the teeth, to the exact same similar profile and size. So when I'm hand filing, if and I kind of I like to keep my chains real sharp. If I'm taking four file strokes to sharpen that dullest tooth to the point that it needs to be sharp. Every other tooth gets four file strokes also to make sure I'm maintaining the size and length of that tooth, okay? Um, all right, and there are some things on the chain itself that you can use as guides, okay? So this little one is what the side of it should look like. That's a side profile. Here's a top profile, so that gives you the correct angle. It's 30 degree angle on <clears throat> most of these saws. It also has a wear limit on your raker and a wear limit on the bottom. So when you exceed that point, when you get past these point, that chain's done, put a new one on. But it gives you a, a kind of an eyeball of what the angle should be in starting. And you want to get the right size file, okay? About 20% of the file should stick up above the top of the tooth. So this file, as you can see, is too small. It's going to cut a big C shape in there, make it a real grabby chain, and it really never gets to the top edge, which is where it cuts. 
this one's the correct size, about 20% of the file or so above the top of the, of the cutter. And this one you can see is too big, it's simply gonna lay it back, okay? And if you don't know which one it is, you can come in and see us. Here's um, on your uh, chain box, new box that gives you the size. Here's the table. I think I might have that in that handout too. If not, you can come into our saw shop, any place, you know, just tell them what chain you have and they'll give you the right size, okay? There's putting your, 30, your angle on at 30 degrees. Okay, so 30 degrees, if you draw a line perpendicular out from the bar, it's 30 degrees after that. You file away from you, okay? So this will be filed that way, this will be filed from this side, but you do all one side first, turn around and then do the other side. Here is your little filing guide, there's your 30 degree line, okay? Looking at it from under the bar, this is 90 degrees, okay? And it explains it right up there again. And this is a good way to hold uh, 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 your saw. I put mine in a vise. If I'm out in the woods, I throw it in a, a partly cut log or a curve for up in the tailgate of my pickup or on a trailer with a block of wood underneath it, but just something to hold it so that it, it's secured and it's not flopping around when I'm trying to, to file. Uh, okay, and I already mentioned all that, cutting the right amount of strokes. Okay, rakers. Uh, let me explain the rakers. They're the depth gauges. They tell each tooth how deep it's to cut. And how deep it can cut not only tells you how fast it's going to cut through, but how much power it's going to take. So if those rakers are, are real shallow in relationship to the, um, uh, let's see, let me, let me go back a couple of slides and I can explain it better that way, I think. Yeah, this one right here, I can explain it off this one. Okay, so this is your raker. And and if I if I ran a line parallel here and a line parallel here, that distance between the two should be about 25 thousandths of an inch for most chains. And if this raker, and you can see as you sharpen this, this tooth, how it gets lower and lower in relationship to the raker. So when this tooth gets way down here, pretty soon it's about even with the top of the raker. So you're taking a very little bite with each tooth, okay? Um, and, and so you're not cutting very fast, but conversely, if this raker is way down here, and you're taking this great big bite, you're going to run out of power in a hurry with that with that that saw. So it's a balancing act. So about every actually, when I'm doing grinding in the shop, I check it every because it's not my chain; it's a customer's chain. I check it every time. Mine, I know just by practice and looking at it. Uh, about every fourth or fifth time I sharpen it, I'll check my rakers. And then if the rakers are too low, let me get back to this other slide here. If the rakers are too low, I put the I put the gauge on it like this, and I will check. Okay, and you can see this raker is just flush with the top, and that is okay because that distance is about twenty five thousandths of an inch. That'll cut like a dream. Okay, and you can see another view of it from here from the top. This one is a little high. This, by the way, is an, another thing. That's a, a low kickback chain. That has nothing to do with the raker, but I can feel that. You can see it's a, it's probably about ten thousandths of an inch too high. So I will take in my file. And I will file that. There's a filing guide you can place right over the top of it. And here's this is ours is on the end. Um, you file that with the guide on it because that guide is hard and it won't let you file down in and it protects the tooth too. See, won't let you file down into it. Uh, and this is the, the two in one which does the file and or does the raker and the cutter at the same time. So it does it all at once. If you're using that, you don't have to worry about um, getting into uh, your raker. Okay. Um, most saw shops offer a sharpening service. You take the chain off and bring it into your saw shop. Or if you have an extra chain or two, just put them on and keep cutting. Or if you leave the chain on the saw and you bring it in, we use the charge the lecture. Uh, our price for a 20 inch chain is 10 bucks to sharpen it off the saw. But so we clean it up, inspect the clutch and everything in the sprocket nose, clean the bar, flip the bar, and we do all those kinds of things. So you really get your money out of it for that little bit of extra. And, and in the end, that's what you want right there, okay? So um, just some odds and ends here. Uh, I know we're, we're really out of time, um, but I wanna cover just a few other things. This is our service department. And so we're pretty much all set up to do all those kinds of things. If you have any questions and you wanna come in and see us, I don't care if you're a customer of ours or not, but ask your question, I'd rather have you be happy with what you're, you're doing, okay? Um, what are these things on the front? People see these things and there's a lot of mystique around this, this around these big log uh, bumper spikes or log dogs they're called. Um, 
And on bigger saws, they're bigger because the bark is bigger on bigger trees. And what that is, the grip give you a grip to kind of hold the saw in place. They're not meant to really for you to pry on uh, because if you have to pry in your saw when you're cutting, that means your chain is dull. You need to correct that problem. Um, so on the smaller ones, they'll be small like this. And all they are is simply to give you a grip onto the bark to help hold the, hold the saw in place while you're cutting. Um, what's the difference between a skip tooth and a full complement chain? That's another one I get all the time because I get people coming in, they got a 16 inch chainsaw and my brother-in-law is a logger and he says the only one to use is a skip tooth chain. Well, that's right because your brother-in-law is probably cutting with a 36 inch bar on big fur. But when you're cutting with your small saw, you don't need a full, you don't need a skip tooth chain. A skip tooth chain, you see the difference between the length, the distance between these cutters here and the distance here. There's third less teeth basically. So what it does is, Every tooth that moves through the wood takes some horsepower. And if you've got a, let's say a 10 inch diameter log and you've got five teeth in that and each one takes two tenths of a horsepower, you've got a full horsepower to, to force those teeth through that wood. If you're using a skip tooth, which has a third less, now all of a sudden you're only three quarters of a horsepower. So when you get out there at the full length of a bar, particularly on the big bars we use in the woods, yeah, it's going to help you keep that chain moving because remember it's chain speed and chain sharpness is how fast you cut. So on the bigger saws, yeah, we use uh, professionally skip tooth chains and, and when you get out there like to 25 or 30 or 32 inches, it may well be worth your, uh, your time to put on a skip tooth chain. They cost the same as a full comp chain, but I will tell you in the same wood on the same power head, a skip tooth chain will cut a third slower because they have a third less teeth, okay? So just remember that. All right, and then, so the other thing is what is a, and a low kickback or a, called a green chain? Starting about 1995, the Consumer Product Safety Commission required all occasional use or consumer saws, which were typically things uh, under about 45 cc's. So in Steel's world, that's a 251 or, or smaller to have a low kickback chain. And people have mistakenly called them a safety chain or an anti-kickback chain. There is folks, there is no such thing as a safe chain. There's no such thing as a chain that will totally prevent kickback. It can happen when you touch the end of the bar on any object out here, even inside the wood, it will throw that thing back at you at 60 miles an hour with a chain running and hopefully you got a good grip on the saw and hopefully that chain break works, okay? Um, I'm not going to say anymore because it'll, it'll, it gets gory after that, believe me, okay? Uh, so what a, a low kickback chain does is, okay, this is the raker. In a normal operation, that little projection on the next driver is running alongside the raker. So it's not interfering with the cut. But when you get out to the end of the bar, where this bar nose runs around, the chain runs around the bar nose, see how it opens up and gives you a little extra rider for, here's your raker, there is your little extra rider, your low kickback chain. So it's something for it to ride on so it can't grab and throw that saw back at you. It's not foolproof, but it kind of helps. It does not slow your cutting down in normal cutting, okay? But it is a safety feature. Um, and here, and the other question is, what is ripping chain? If any of you are planning on doing milling of logs, like with an Alaska mill, um, or a similar device, in other words, cutting the log lengthwise rather than crossways, I would recommend you put a, a, uh, a ripping chain on it. And they're different. They have 10 degree angles here instead of 30 at the teeth. And then they'll go a cutter and in two teeth with the tops cut off because ripping chain cuts on the side. And this gives ef extra clearance and it cuts faster, okay, in, in the ripping than in um, cross cutting. So one more slide here. Uh, that's my toolbox. That's how I keep my stuff organized, how I take my stuff out in the woods. I said I use a gallon can. There it is right there. Um, and I've got my safety equipment in it. Um, I've got my, uh, well, some of my safety equipment, my chaps aren't in that, but my eye protection, my hearing protection is in there. Bar oil, uh, an extra chain, usually wedges, my scrunch, hand protection, and so on. So I'm going to uh, think we're going to have to quit here, Catherine. I've got more stuff, but we're out of time, I think, unless yeah. I steal a few minutes. Um, uh, we still, we don't have any other questions, but we do still have some people on and a good number. And so, yeah, what questions do people have? So, 
come up with questions. Let me show you this one. This is what happens when you leave the chain brake on in a bank case. And that was an operator error, um, leaving the chain brake on. It's like leaving your emergency brake on your car and driving to town with it on. Uh, something catches on fire. In this case, it was the chainsaw. Um, here's a uh, uh, master control lever. Okay, so starting the saw uh, three ways, starting it on the ground. See, I've got it pinned to the ground, holding it down and a quick yank on the saw. Um, or between the legs like this, okay, works well on the small saws or the other way we uh, this approved and, and even by, uh, in fact, this is how we started in the woods. It was approved by the safety and, uh, Washington Safety Industrial Health Act. The saw is over the top of a log, we call it blocked, and you're using the saw, you drop the saw with one hand and pull up with the other hand for heavier saws, uh, the bigger range is harder starting. And you notice I'm wearing my full protective gear, there's my chaps, my gloves, my hearing protection is in my ears. I got my hard hat on and I always always wear safety glasses just as a matter of habit, but it keeps the chips and things out of my eyes. If you see people drop starting a saw like this, don't, please don't do that because if this saw, saw kicks or tries to start, there's no way to control the saw, the, the, the woods. If the safety inspector saw me do that, it was a major fine for me and my employer. Um, so it's not, I know people do that, but please don't either start it like this over a log with a bigger saw, longer bar between the legs like this or on the ground. And this is the way we start all of our saws in the shop is a demonstration and safety thing, so, okay? Um, there, one question did come in. Are there any special glove considerations or just leather gloves? Well, I wear, um, actually I wear those white ox gloves you see me wearing. Um, and, and the reason I wear those over leather gloves, leather gloves are fine, but the, my problem is I'm always out in the wet and, and the water and leather don't work well, they get slippery. And then when they dry out, they harden up. So I like these white ox gloves or a good heavy cotton glove that protect my hands. Um, they won't protect them from a saw cut. I don't know that any gloves really will uh, well, but um, they do protect my hands from most things. And uh, then I can wash them or dry them out or whatever when they get when they get wet. But leather gloves, I wear them in the summertime um, a lot. But uh, like I say, they, in the wintertime when I'm out cutting a lot, they don't they don't mix well with water. It's my only my only concern about leather gloves. Otherwise, they're fine. Anything that's going to protect your hands. And what type of ear protection do you use? Um, okay, that's a good one because there are a number and I didn't really get to that one. Let me see if I can whip through, whip through these things here real quick. Okay, here we go. There's my, this is what I wore in the woods. There's my corks, my hard hat. There's my, what I wear those. In fact, right here, my hickory shirt that I'm wearing right now, I've got a pair of them. I always carry them with me because I wear them when I'm driving tractor or lawnmower or rototiller or chainsaw or whatever. I, I've always got them on. Uh, my safety glasses, they're kind of a sunglass safety glass. There's my gloves and uh, of course chaps. Uh, what I was wearing that particular day was those earplugs. Uh, here's uh, one, uh, Steel has these, Husqvarna has these, all different makes have these kind of, it's a hard hat combination with a face shield and ear protection, or you can wear just these kind. Um, I like these uh, foam plugs because I can wear them with my hard hat and I get full range of movement without, without any interference. But these uh, uh, earmuffs work well, these kind work well. In fact, I usually wear this when I'm doing my uh, either hedge trimmer or string trimmer uh, using it. So whatever you use to protect your ears, uh, do it. Get in the habit of doing it. That's the big thing. Okay, no other questions. Um, we're getting some gratitude, which is very nice. We're happy to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, we're, uh, um, you know, that's me at, at work. And so we're always happy to talk to anybody. Like I say, you don't have to be a customer, just come in. And if you have questions about your unit, we're glad to help. Uh, we only work on steel equipment because that's the only thing we have access for parts to. Um, but I can make chains and things, sharpen chains for any make a saw. Um, I'm at Arlington Hardware in downtown Arlington. If you haven't been there, come visit us. Um, we've been there since 1903. The saw shop's been there since about night, about 2010, I think now, 2008, uh, 12, I think. But uh, family owned operation, a good operation. I enjoy working there. Um, 
I say, I am going to retire. You know, everybody has a dream job you really want to do. And this is absolutely my dream job of uh, working with people and working with saws. And, and uh, yeah, it's just a good place. So, thank you for very attending good. class. <laughs> thank you very much, Steve. And thank you all to the participants for um, hanging on with us and asking great questions. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up. I will stop recording.